the only state that has any regulation for DAOs currently is Wyoming. Um, and based on the use cases that you've shared with us and all the ones that you have in your brain swimming around. I know. <laughs> what? I mean, first of all, can we regulate something that's decentralized? Are those two things, can they work together or are they, what am I trying to say? Yeah, no. Um, can you have a successful DAO? I think what's interesting is that is what people in Web3 is trying to hash out right now and play nice a little bit with um, governments because whether we like it or not, um, those with us, of us within um, DAOs or the decentralized space, uh, the government is still going to try to regulate. You know, and um, so it's kind of like a David and Goliath situation where you really want David to win. (laughs) But there's so many regulatory actors that want a piece of the space um, that it's going to be very, very, very difficult. And I think the unfortunate thing about um, regulation in a traditional way because there's there's an argument for both, and and I'll go again. I'll go with the argument against first. So the argument against doing something like a five hundred one c three or an LLC is that you are really taking away the uh, intent of a DAO, which is the way it should be structured. So um, you know uh, if you uh, if you have filed ever for a traditional business license. You have to list your board of directors, your president, your secretary, um, your treasurer. You have to, everyone has to have a role that's more centralized. Um, you also have to, uh, you know, it, it keep keep lots and lots of records. Um, some records almost too encumbersome for the average person. Um, like an average person that just starts a DAO online, they don't they um, they don't have to hire an accountant or an attorney. They don't have to seek out um, paid for advice. You know, so you know you're kind of excluding a lot of those people, um, and you're also you know you're excluding if you're in the United States, like you said, you compared it to Wyoming. If you're outside the United States, you're also limiting the global community aspect. And, and what do I mean by that is um, A lot of times, if you are within a traditional structure, there has to be a paper trail for who buys shares or who donates. You can have anonymous donors, but, um, you know, I have a traditional fundraising background, and a lot of times those things are on record, you know. And so if those things are on record, is somebody from another part of the world really going to donate? And am am I going to be able to keep track of that? You know, because we're just all wallet addresses. We have an anonymity, which I think is a beautiful thing. I think having anonymity within Web3 is like, it's incredible, you know, because, and I'll give an example of like raising, raising money. So if you're, if you're raising money for a cause that has a lot of interest to see you fail. So for example, like um, sex trafficking. You know, um, something that's not good, not easy to talk about, something that's not fun to talk about. But there would be a lot of people that would want to see you who would want to stop that fail. You know, um, there would be a lot of people who would want to see you um, not succeed in, in even even saving one soul from something like that. And um, so anonymity, being anonymous and being an anonymous donor is a huge thing that would protect you. You know, it would protect you, you know, and so that's why I think being a part of traditional structure, um, as the government proposes, takes away some of that anonymity. And and that's that's the unfortunate part. Um, and, um, you know, it just limits. I think it just limits, which is what traditionally I think government structures do. It just limits uh, on the other side for, of it um, is that. I do think there needs to be some sort of protection for people who choose to organize around a common interest. And what do I mean by that? Um, I don't think that their personal assets should be have the ability to, to be um, sued by anybody. You know, so just because you're a member of a DAO and another member of the DAO does something wrong, 
um, then maybe the whole treasury or you um, are personally liable, you know, and, and those things have not been worked out yet. You know, they have in a traditional L- – that's why you form an LLC is you protect your personal assets. That's why you, you form a 501c3 is you protect your personal assets. Um, the organization takes the brunt of it and not you. Well, with a DAO, everybody um, – you're not under an umbrella of protection. And so because of that, um, there is an argument for figuring out some sort of mechanism um, or legal protective structure that would um, – protect people from liability because I can't control all actors within a DAO, if that makes any sense. Exactly. No, it does because, <clears throat> I mean, that brings us back to the decentralized component. Right. There's no single entity that's controlling it. It's the whole group. It's very democratic kind of in that way. Yeah. Is that a proper use of the term? Yes. Yeah, it is. It is. And it, and it yeah, and it's not um, – that. that's what I think – the government has not – and I know the Texas Blockchain Council is doing some work right now looking at how DAOs, like you're working with legislators directly to look at how you can kind of have a basis in a, a protective structure, but trying to preserve some things that are very, very good about DAOs, you know. And I think that's the that's going to be kind of what needs to be hashed out, like moving forward. And, um, you know, I'm... And it, and, it, and it's like I, I'm kind of like I had all this talk planned, and I don't know how we ended up here, but that's like you know where where things are going. 